last two years, Australia's unforgiving climate has bared its teeth. What we were seeing was a confluence of uh, weather patterns that we hadn't seen since the early 1970s. After a decade of mostly dry, the landscape slowly dying of thirst has been waterlogged. How do you warn people that a wall of water is going to come out of nowhere? Oh, El Nino, the boy child, the weather phenomenon that brought drought and bushfires was gone. Another had taken its place. The girl child, El Nino's opposite. Thousands of people in evacuation centres right through Eastern Australia. The intensity and the speed of the whole event was quite amazing. It was outside my experience. For two years, weather experts reported and warned of the changes. Heavy rain is now moving through Bendigo, Victoria. We're getting 171 millimetres. It's heaviest We are rain. expecting damaging winds. They saw the echoes in history. They understood Australia's dangerous stance of geography and climate. They watched as El Nino weakened. The monsoonal rain is absolutely bucketing down. The rain has just arrived. You can hear the thunder booming across the town. Now, time to learn from the cycle. It's happened before. It will happen again. These were just terrible, terrible times. It's a creator of great Australian prosperity. It can also be responsible for heartbreak and catastrophe. This is what happens when La Nina strikes. January 2011, a month that shocked the world. These horrors are now embedded in the consciousness of Australia. When we all cried for Queensland. The flash floods of Toowoomba. Murphy's Creek. <laughs> and Grantham. Then the Brisbane River breaking its banks and taking all before it. Oh my God, is he off? Oh my God, he's hanging on. Oh my God. Is he, oh my God. <gasps> it took him, Jack. Finally, the destructive force of Cyclone Yassi. reducing whole towns to rubble. These events didn't occur randomly. They were far more likely to occur under the influence of La Nina. And it was because of La Nina that they happened in succession. To understand how it came to this, you need look no further than when the weather was dominated by La Nina's opposite, El Nino. That phenomenon led to another equally destructive weather event, Black Saturday.
February 7, 2009. One of Australia's most catastrophic weather tragedies. It was like someone turned a volcano on its side and was shooting it at you. We've seen some uh, very severe fires in the past, of course, such as the, uh, the Ash Wednesday fires back in 1983. Uh, some of the older people remember 1939, the Black Friday fires, but I've been in meteorology for nearly 40 years now. I've never seen fires move like that. Meteorologists watch for the signs of extreme weather, and in the lead up to February 7, alarm bells were ringing. We're coming to you live on the Weather Channel with the news that we have literally just broken this Melbourne heatwave record in the last few minutes. And on the day, Melbourne actually reached 46 degrees, which is extraordinary. We saw these bushfires not only as a result of that week of the heatwave, but also really 10 years of drought before that. The science of reading and interpreting the weather told them that after years of dry, that February's extended period of extreme heat Coupled with a dramatic wind change, just needed a spark to create a maelstrom. Unfortunately, no one could have predicted the size and ferocity of the Black Saturday disaster. One hundred and seventy-three lives lost, hundreds more injured. More than 7,500 people displaced. 2,020 plus homes burnt to the ground. Thousands of acres of farmland and bush destroyed. As Victoria mourned its dead, consoled its survivors and counted the costs of Black Saturday, Australia wanted to know one thing. How could this have happened? Meteorologists knew that Black Saturday had been a weather event years in the making, including, in part, to a succession of dry weather years that had created a tinder dry combustible bush and subsoil almost devoid of moisture. During times of drought, the water table drops continuously and it's replenished, of course, every time you get rain. But if you have a long, dry spell, the water table and the actual moisture content of the soil in the upper uh, few metres becomes extremely dry. And in fact, it contains very little or no water. This extended dry was in part due to a naturally occurring weather pattern, nicknamed centuries ago by Peruvian fishermen as El Nino. To understand such weather patterns, Meteorologists look closely at sea surface temperatures across the equatorial regions of the Pacific Ocean. Rains tend to follow the warmer ocean waters and with help from changes in the prevailing winds, move back and forth across the equatorial Pacific Ocean in irregular cycles that last anywhere between two and eight years. The trade winds of the Pacific normally blow from the east and this moves the warmer waters over the western side of the Pacific Ocean, adjacent to northern Australia. But sometimes this sea surface pattern reverses, when the prevailing winds help blow the warmer waters over towards the central Pacific. Then Australia is more commonly left in drought. This pattern of sea surface temperatures is known as El Nino. A lot of research is going into what actually causes, what actually prompts the beginning of any La Nina or El Nino phase, but at the moment, scientists still are um, uncertain exactly what triggers an event. Well, there's no standard rule that you can apply. Just because you may have a very strong El Nino, that doesn't always mean you'll then go to a very strong La Nina. Sometimes it means you could just go to neutral conditions the following year, and you may not get a La Nina for a few years after. By February 09, like all farmers who rely on the weather for their livelihood, Horsham goat farmer Rowena Doyle had had a gutful. We had 13 years of drought. The, the water in the river was actually killing the stock, so we had to then cut because the water was so saline it wasn't fit for stock consumption. Horsham, in Western Victoria, was one of the first towns to report fires on Black Saturday. 
Rowena had welcomed the cool relief at first when the winds changed, then watched in horror when the fire turned. It started on the uh, western side of Horsham. It, it put the, the fire went south and then the wind changed and it, and it forced it up east of Horsham. So it pretty much ringed um, Horsham. You could see all the smoke. We knew it was getting close. Uh, the smoke turned black and it had hit the house across the road, had uh, caught fire and was going up. The guys come down and say that it's on your property and it's heading directly for you. Ironically, Rowena's goats had eaten down the grasses that surrounded her house. It acted like a firebreak. She was one of the lucky few. We were very lucky. I mean, we had you know, minimal damage, but it uh, could have been much, much worse. Yeah, so thanks to the goats. <laughs> What Rowena and the farmers of Horsham couldn't know in February 2009 was that they were destined to experience firsthand two extreme Australian weather events at either end of the spectrum. For El Nino, the harbinger of drought was on the wane. His opposite twin, La Nina, was about to make her presence felt. The Pacific Ocean is by far the biggest uh, body of water in the world and uh, when you get uh, warm and cold areas of water developing which are, are unusually warm or cold, it has a huge effect on, uh, on the weather, not only for Australia but also places like South America, even North America. Uh, there are signals of the uh, Pacific Ocean in, in all the countries around the Pacific Rim. If the Pacific easterly trade winds are unusually strong and water temperatures across the central and eastern equatorial Pacific cool, then more warm water than usual accumulates near Australia. Normally this will bring an increase in rainfall to much of eastern and central Australia. This is La Nina, drought saviour. As we now know, can be Australia's heartache. In the aftermath of the Black Saturday bushfires, it was hard to even imagine a time of too much water, a time of La Nina. Twelve months on, it's hard to remember we were ever dry. From the 10th to the 12th of January 2010, an intense rolling heat wave affected South Australia, Victoria, southern inland New South Wales and Tasmania. This triggered catastrophic fire danger warnings. But even as these impacts were felt in the south, rains in the north were a sign that something was changing. A shift that was occurring thousands of kilometres away was soon to alter Australia's disaster focus. The trade winds in the Pacific were on the move. We've actually got buoys anchored across various parts of the Pacific Ocean measuring sea surface temperatures so scientists can get an idea of where the warm water is surging. The warm water surges back and forth in a restless motion uh, that uh, really determines the uh, La Nina, El Nino and has such a huge effect on Australian rainfall. Australian regions like Ellis Springs and the Central Desert Countryside of Victoria. Victoria, which has been so dry. At Wangaratta, we're still seeing extensive rural flooding. It's making Western New South Wales and the entire eastern seaboard of Queensland. What Bundaberg is famous for, the Bundaberg Rum Distillery, is in there somewhere. We'll experience more than their fair share of this wet change in the months to come. But in early 2010, the change from drought was small but significant. 
The amazing thing about working in the weather is that you know what climate patterns are capable of. You know what Mother Nature can do. You know whether, what a particular weather event is going to do to a part of the country. However, when it starts to happen, you can't help but be overwhelmed by the magnitude and the power of what you're seeing. On the spot amateur snapshots and the most direct method of witnessing weather events as they happen. And most weather watchers are more than happy to share. Weather is one of the only things on Earth that affects every single person, every single day, no matter what they do, no matter who they are. And as a result, we have this incredible connection with our viewers. People love to share their weather stories. When people send in their photos, they're literally welcoming us into their world. And it really brings home how powerful these weather events are and what an effect it has on people. In early 2010, viewers' pictures of inland Australia changed from dry dust storms to dark skies. Thick clouds filling the horizon. And best of all, rain. For sure, you could never say that Australian weather is boring. As a weather presenter, this is what keeps me on my toes. And when it comes to extremes, for well, the outback takes the cake. For a lot of parts of the country, people might be thinking it's a boring weather day, it's just sunny, but I can guarantee you that somewhere in Australia there is an extraordinary event happening with regards to the weather, and that makes it very exciting and challenging to report on. We've got 50 degree temperatures, sub zero overnight minimums. Flooding rain, so let me just wipe that so you can see me, and howling winds. What don't we have? It's early 2010. While the southern states swelter and memories of the Black Saturday bushfires still fresh, the first signs of a welcome change appear in the most unlikely of places. The normally dry, dusty heart of Australia, Alice Springs. Every year, thousands of spectators line the banks of the Todd River to watch the Henley on Todd Regatta. One thing sets Alice Springs annual regatta apart from all others. The complete absence of water. This riverbed is bone dry, which means that the competitors literally run along the riverbed in bottomless boats. But a Weather Channel viewer captured the most remarkable scene. Zachy, do you want to run in the water? Run in front. When a creek that's normally dry starts to flow, you know something significant is happening. The dry curiosity that is the Todd River was filled with waters from tropical rain events and the town was soaked. Well, it all started back in December 2009. We still had El Nino conditions, but we saw a tropical cyclone. This was Lawrence, moved through the central part of Australia. Then the El Nino weakened through the rest of the summer and we got consistent heavy rainfall, mainly from tropical lows and cyclones through the northern part of the country, right through January to February 2010. More than 50% of the Northern Territory has had over 100 millimetres of rain in the last seven days. Alice Springs itself over four times its February average rainfall. It's unbelievable. And because the outback country is so flat, it has literally turned the desert into a raging inland sea. It's very dangerous. It's flowing very fast. For the residents of the town, it was business as usual even though large parts of the Ellis were cut off by fast-flowing waters. As the rain continued to fall, the rest of Australia wondered if and when it would be their turn. 
At this stage, we weren't actually saying that, uh, yes, there's going to be a La Nina. It was too early to say. And uh, sometimes you can get these bursts of tropical moisture that then stop. But uh, with the La Nina, of course, it kept on going and we started getting these uh, rain events one after the other. You could be forgiven for thinking this was a river raging through Hyde Park here in Townsville. But in fact, it's not. It's localised flooding. And the monsoonal rain is absolutely bucketing down at the moment. Even better, week after week, the rains were moving south. We were initially pleased with the situation because there was water getting down into the Murray-Darling Basin, which was uh, act actually in very, very poor shape up until that stage. It was incredibly dry. Uh, we had um, uh, situations where the uh, parts of the river were barely running. And we've got the perfect recipe for thunderstorms at the moment with the warm northerly wind coming in, meaning colder air coming in from the south. It's creating instability and the perfect recipe for thunderstorm activity, which we're experiencing right now. La Nina or not, the water was a godsend. Across the country, paddocks were soaked and farm dams began to fill. Desperate farmers couldn't wait to share their joy. Today there, we have just hit 300 millimetres of rain in the last 12 hours and it's still pouring. It's looking good. We recorded 72 millilitres of rain for the month of May. That is just fantastic. We had 58 millimetres rain, and that's the best February rain we've had in six years. That's 17 mil, and it actually is pouring here, and we are so grateful because it was getting so desperate. It's fabulous. It's raining at last. We desperately need this 14 years of below average rain that's depleted our supplies. This is fantastic news for us. It's the best news all year on top of saturated wet ground. Have a great day. You go and talk to any farmer around Queensland and they'll often tell you, you, know, you that a drought ends with a flood. And uh, we certainly saw some of that in early 2010. Dams were full for the first time in a decade. and. Uh, you know, that's, that's a, a prospect that fills people's hearts with joy because they know it means potentially bumper crops for the first time and they can start to plan for a much more secure financial future. Flying into somewhere like Rockhampton, I remember going in there and saying, it looks like I'm flying into Dublin, you know, and Rocky, Rocky hadn't looked like that for 10 years. A real sense of just how beautiful this country is when it's had a bit of rain. You knew that something extraordinary had happened. There was a psychological shift in the bush, as though a dusty shroud had been washed away. And it wasn't just Queensland. What a difference a week makes. Let's take a look at the past seven days, Tom, because it has been absolutely tremendous, especially across the southern half of the nation. Josh, every southern agricultural part of Australia has seen rain over the past week. Here's the past seven days map. It's due to a low pressure system. It went from the west coast on Saturday. It's now sitting near the New South Wales coast. And speaking of the recent rain, it's even pushed across areas of South Australia, which have been relatively dry. And I tell you what, Phil, he was pretty impressed. Rain and snow down the last couple of days has been absolutely brilliant. I think 38 millimetres last night is one of the heaviest falls I've had for some time. It will benefit the crops that are already in and also the ones that are just about to go in. We've seen a few farmers in the hotel that are extremely happy and they're smiling just brilliantly at the minute. The Murray-Darling Basin, many people call it the food bowl of Australia, it's gone through a prolonged dry spell. In fact, below average rain recorded each and every year between 2001 and 2009. Now 2010, finally with this strong La Nina, everything turned around the basin recorded its wettest year on record and that's quite significant because records have been kept since 1900. As a result, water storage levels through the Murray-Darling Basin went from 26% at the beginning of 2010 to above 80% by the end of the year. In the Wimmera region of Victoria, where Horsham had been devastated by bushfires little more than 12 months earlier, spirits lifted. Well, Horsham and the whole of the Wimmera actually has probably been stretched to their uh, emotional limits. And then along come the rains this last year, and everybody thought, boy, and, and it, out in the paddocks, it was the best crops that we'd had for probably 25 years. Darrell Argyle of the Wimmera Catchment Management Authority couldn't be happier. Instead of restricting water, he was emptying dams. There's a lot of money in mud. There's no money in dust, and we need to have a lot more, uh, you know, not, not severe events, 
but just a lot more general rain. Across the country, there was talk of bumper crops. The good times were back. Send her down, Huey, was the catch cry, and Huey obliged. What you hear over and over again is backup rain. People want backup rain. And uh, you start getting the backup rain, and it's exciting to report on, and you start seeing the fortunes of the farmers turning. They're getting their regular rainfall. Then you get to the stage where you're like, OK, this is good, because this is actually getting down into the subsoil. This is actually proving to be long-term benefits for the nation. So we're getting a lot of rain, we're causing flooding, but there's still some upside to this because it's going to be good in the long term. 9am yesterday, Ballina picked up 171 millimetres, its heaviest rain in six years. Here's some pictures of Sydney, which has been very wet and windy. In fact, Sydney's just come out of its wettest May in seven years, picking up about 169 millimetres in a 24-hour period. We've also just had the wettest autumn in 20 years for Canberra. Along with the wet, there were some unusual events. Not all of them expected. A supercell thunderstorm with a tornado ripped through Lennox Head on Thursday morning, causing widespread destruction. This was definitely a tornado. It started off on the ocean, then pushed ashore at Lennox Head. It was probably rated as an F1 or F2 on the Fajuta scale. Now, not quite as large as some of the cousins that we see over in the United States, but definitely a tornado. Looking at the damage, it's most likely that the wind speeds were up and over 150 kilometers an hour, possibly well higher than that through some parts of town. And still the rain continued to fall. We got a whole lot of repetition. We just had one uh, rain event after the other. And uh, the ground is like a sponge filling up with water. When it gets uh, to a certain extent, um, any extra water you add to the sponge just runs off the top. The sponge can't take any more. And that's the situation we got into uh, probably uh, in the middle part of, uh, of 2010. People in the bush began to experience conditions they hadn't seen for decades. Now, fair dinkum, look at the size of this thing. We are talking about incredible forces to bring down a tree of this size. This low pressure system is whipping up some fairly intense winds and it's knocking down trees all over the place through country Victoria. Uh, we're right near Beechworth at the moment and you can see this is a massive tree that has fallen down. The severe weather and flooding continues here in Victoria. Just have The flood warnings point. became a focus of daily updates from weather reporters. Now we have seen warning after warning released, warning people of the dangers, especially for flash flooding. When we started thinking quite strongly, yes, a La Nina, that looked to all intents and purposes a great year. We had the rain, uh, we had the crops really growing well, and then of course the rain just didn't stop. Major flooding is still occurring here in northeast Victoria. The Caravan Park here in Wangaratta completely underwater once again. At Kyala Lakes in Shepparton, a few homes are isolated. Marker boys in the West Pacific off Australia's north coast were indicating the ocean was warming. And this was creating moist tropical air and sending clouds inland. What we saw through autumn of 2010, a rapid transition from El Nino to La Nina conditions. So through the central Pacific, the sea surface temperatures were cooling down rapidly and the waters off the north coast of Australia were warming up rapidly. Now what that set up was your classic La Nina signal. And what happens when you have cold water through the central Pacific and warmer than normal water near Indonesia in the western Pacific, you get stronger than normal easterly trade winds and that pumps moisture, rainfall right through northern and eastern parts of Australia. Now, Dick, it's just been incredible, the amount of flooding that we've seen across Victoria. Oh, look, incredible indeed, Lee. Uh, it's, it's been many years since we've seen these scenes in um, parts of Victoria. Uh, look at these uh, flooded properties, of course, which is a, a tragedy, but of course, we've seen a replenishment of uh, many of the uh, water supplies right across the state, which is the good side of the story. But we had the fires in 2009 and many flood events in 2010. A lot of people in Victoria are asking themselves, what's going to happen next? What happened next shocked the world. This is Surface Paradise for the 
the best part of the year, but today it is a surfers and beachgoers nightmare. Now what we're seeing is the waves breaking dangerously close to the coastline, resulting in erosion. And not only that, near gale force winds have stirred up the sea into a washing machine and it's basically dumped a whole mass of foam and dirt right across the beach. It is an extremely bizarre scene. I've covered flooding rains through the outback. I've seen damaging winds. I've done heat waves and I've done unseasonal snowfall. But this is something like Armageddon. It almost gives me the same sort of energy and feeling that we got from the dust storms when something so normal was transformed into something so bizarre. It was quite remarkable, the transition. We went from El Nino to La Nina rapidly through autumn of 2010. By winter, the La Nina through the Pacific Ocean was well established, and most northern and eastern parts of Australia were already seeing well above average rainfall. Uh, it strengthened further through the spring, and in fact, the second half of the year was Australia's wettest on record. Now, one of the ways we measure the strength of a La Nina is called the Southern Oscillation Index, and that measures the difference in pressure between Tahiti, the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and Darwin, in the northern part of Australia. Now, that value averaged plus 21 through that period from August to December. That was the highest average value there since 1917. By late 2010, the onset of La Nina was well recognised. Record rains fell. But what concerned meteorologists was a second system developing over the tropical Indian Ocean. When we've got warm water near Australia, um, we, that's the La Nina situation, that tends to promote uh, tropical air coming down through Australia and increase rainfall for much of eastern and central Australia, which of course we've seen. Uh, when you get warm water on the Indian Ocean side, that also creates a situation where cloud develops there and tends to carry across Australia. So we've had uh, both operating at once uh, during 2010 and uh, uh, both acting in tandem. The sea surface temperature patterns across the equatorial Pacific Ocean were in what meteorologists call a La Nina phase. The Indian Ocean equivalent of La Nina is called the negative Indian Ocean dipole. This occurs when the equatorial Indian Ocean is warmer on the Australian side than the African side. If this happens at the same time as La Nina, Australia's moisture feeders are working overtime. Both of these climate patterns lead to above average rainfall. Happening at the same time, you get flooding across the country. There was also a third influence, the monsoonal trough that generated record floods in Pakistan and China and this would be making its annual migration south for a summer rendezvous with Australia. We were looking at the events in Pakistan and China uh, with some concern about the middle of 2010 because there was always going to be a chance that that trough would maintain its intensity as it moved back towards us, which it did. When all these weather systems combined, Australia was a sitting duck. As a meteorologist, this is something that I find particularly amazing because we've got two juicy climate patterns happening at the same time. A negative Indian Ocean dipole and a La Nina, both leading to warm sea surface temperatures that bring above average rain. And we haven't seen both happening at the same time in over 30 years. We had a warning from the Weather Bureau in October that was so dire I thought the whole cabinet needed to be briefed. Warnings about La Nina and uh, the monsoonal activity, and warnings that what we were seeing was a confluence of uh, weather patterns that we hadn't seen since the early 1970s. The Bureau warned us that we could see up to six cyclones across the coast during our wet season. In addition to that, we could expect monsoonal rain in, in places that would bring severe flooding. We knew we were in for a difficult season, but uh, what came even surpassed those warnings. It's a big weather day right across the nation and uh, we are expecting that rain to continue over the next few days. Yes, flooding isn't the only major concern across eastern Australia. It's the severe thunderstorms that are going to affect South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland later this afternoon. Queenslanders too experiencing flooding. We just had one uh, rain event after the other. With showers and storms expected into tomorrow yet again. Uh, farmers were looking towards Bumper crops, it, it looked tremendous. We had uh, uh, the crops looked in great condition, grain crops across New South Wales, for instance. 
bumper crops. And uh, then of course we got to the stage where the farmers couldn't get in to harvest it uh, because it, it was just too wet. And then uh, it just kept on raining after that and then we started getting reports of widespread crop uh, ruin where the, the, uh, the crops were just dying and rotting in the ground. The poet Dorothea McKellar wrote of her love for our sunburned country, of droughts and flooding rains. But the farmers of the wheat belt in New South Wales had little love for the rains of 2010. In December, the rural hub of Wagga Wagga was drenched. Well, for many farmers through the southeast of the country, it was a cruel blow because they've seen 10 years of drought in many areas and then finally heavy, consistent, widespread rains turned up with the strong La Nina through 2010. But then towards the end of the year, as this La Nina continued to strengthen, we ended up seeing widespread floods. Many of the crops were destroyed. The rain that everybody was dreading has just arrived in Wagga, New South Wales, and it's been coupled with severe thunderstorms. It feels like pins literally going against your body. You can hear the thunder booming across the town. And considering that it's already flooded, this sort of rain is going to lead to worse flooding than we even saw last week. What happens with La Nina, uh, the tropical influence uh, tends to extend much further south than normal. Uh, during a, uh, an average type year, we do get tropical influence, of course, uh, very much over Queensland, the Northern Territory, uh, getting down into northern New South Wales. But during La Nina, uh, what tends to happen is that tropical influence gets much further south than normal. We get high moisture, tropical air coming right down into New South Wales, Victoria, even Tasmania. The tragedy of seeing their cash crops, not to mention their hopes and dreams, ruined under hectares of water, was too much for some farmers. Drought is one of the hardest things uh, I've been through, but I got through that. Um, it didn't, didn't, uh, it didn't, how do I say, destroy me like this flood has. Because water is the most powerful force of Mother Nature, and boy, I never, I'll never ever go through this again. It's hard, real hard. Getting sorry. Getting that <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's not easy. Up north, Queensland was awash. Thanks for staying with us live on the Weather Channel as we continue our comprehensive coverage of the Queensland flood crisis. You'll notice more heavy rain on the way today with widespread cloud cover all the way from the northwest right down to the southeast. Amazingly, this is actually the opposite. On December the 24th, a tropical low developed off the coast of Cairns. 24 hours later, Christmas Day, it was upgraded to tropical cyclone Tasha. It created widespread rain. It's been a wild end to 2010 with widespread heat for the south through the north. It's been all about flooding rains to talk about this more. Let's go to the Weather Channel senior meteorologist Dick Whitaker. Dick, you couldn't really ask for two more weather extremes. We have major flood peaks travelling down several big Queensland river systems and that's going to be an issue now for at least the next week or so. Take a look at the last seven days' rainfall. It's been record-breaking stuff in many areas of the state. Yes, it has, and you can see widespread falls in excess of 150 millimetres there on that chart, extending all the way through eastern Queensland up to the, uh, the top end of the Northern Territory. That's very, very tropical, that set up there, and of course that's generated all the, the heavy rain we saw across Queensland. We were getting surges of tropical air coming uh, right down into Queensland uh, on quite a frequent basis, uh, not just one or two events. We were getting one event after the other, and uh, humidity, high humidity tropical air coming right down into central Queensland and that was just generating one rain event after another um, and that once again is the classic signature of what we is the La Nina. Theodore cotton grower Peter French lives by the weather. He determines how much and when he plants and when he sows. The weather dictates what we do, how we farm. The only thing um, consistent about their weather is its variability. On Christmas Day, this is the site that greeted him. Cotton will survive if any of the plants sits above water. He took to his boat to save his cotton. 
and Joe, his dog. Joe made it. The cotton didn't. I, I guess we were satisfied that we didn't go down without a fight and we did everything we possibly could to, um, to save it. And after spending about four weeks, night and day, and sandbagging and excavators and everything else, it was probably a relief when it finally all went. Um, there was nothing else we could do. Theodore's Dawson River peaked at 14 metres, flooding the town. Elsewhere in central Queensland, other rivers began to break their banks. The last time anything like this had been seen before was 1974. Also a year of La Nina. The intensity of, and the speed of the whole event uh, was certainly uh, quite, uh, quite amazing. It was outside my experience. The events in uh, some of the areas like uh, such as Rockhampton and uh, Emerald, uh, they were uh, probably just as bad, if not worse, than 1974. There was no doubt that uh, it had been a long time since we'd seen whole towns under that kind of water. Rockhampton was the largest city that was impacted. But we saw it in places like Dolby and Chinchilla. We evacuated a whole town for the first time in our history, the town of Theodore. The town of Condamine evacuated twice in a matter of weeks. Emeralds and a lot of smaller places. And I've never seen anything like it. It was the largest expanse of water. Yeah, I don't have any other description for it other than an inland sea. It spanned an area as big as the countries of France and Germany combined. These are areas that are normally cattle grazing areas, so they're pretty tough country. A lot of brown dirt. Most you're ever going to see out there is, is cattle and people droving. And here it was, uh, people going around it in a tinny. <laughs> Amongst those in a tinny was Kay Kelly, her dog, and her Elvis impersonator husband, Sid. They live on board a boat on the Fitzroy. Oh, there's water everywhere. So the water come up to about here, up to the top of this. And we used to take our dinghy across here. So I just used the dinghy to come across. An unexpected result of the floods in Rockhampton was the animals displaced into water especially the snakes. Much to Kay's horror. And Sid's yelling at me, grab the rope, grab the rope. And so he was down one end of the dinghy, and I'm off the bow, and I grabbed what the rope that we had hanging here, big thick rope, and as I grabbed it, this thing was all moving. And I thought, God, this rope's got fat. And then I looked, and here's this, coloured snake banging at me and it dropped clean down and I'm sitting up, it's, it's on my lap. And he's, he said, don't panic, don't panic. And I said, quick, get rid of it. And it's going, It's a good thing we're able to joke about these things in the retelling. It's a natural survival reaction. But at the time, the flood dealt a deep psychological blow. Many residents in Bundaberg are angry that they haven't received much help or communication from the Mayor's Office, the Council and also emergency services. But when you think about it, it is a logistical nightmare. The area that is affected by flooding in Queensland is the size of New South Wales. When you're talking about whole businesses and that have gone completely under and people losing their homes, um, speaking to some of those residents, you do get overwhelmed with emotion because, you know, they may be alive, but they've lost everything. They've run a gym or a bakery, a butchery or something like that, and they've just run that their whole lives. 
and they're completely flooded and, and they don't know what is going to happen next. Of course, there is an upside for farmers like Peter French to the flooding. The sodden ground will maintain moisture for bumper crops next season, as long as there's no major flooding then as well. But for now, the rains haven't finished, and the whole of Queensland is about to be tested. in terms of rainfall across Queensland. Not only is this unseasonal, it is highly unusual. Queenslanders have just come off the back of their wettest September on record. And not only that, the dry season has been virtually non-existent. But I can talk about records and statistics all day long. It's not until you're standing here, not in front of a waterfall, but in front of Wyvernhoe Dam, that you can grasp just how big this rain event really is for Queensland. January 2011. Queensland is reeling from its worst floods in living memory, shutting down whole towns and forcing evacuations in the central part of the state. What we've seen over the past nine months is a very strong La Nina through the Pacific Ocean. That means that temperatures through the central part of the Pacific Ocean are well below normal, but off the northern coastline of Australia, they're much warmer than normal. And that sets up quite a few weather patterns. One, you have much stronger trade winds, so stronger easterly winds pushing across the northern part of Australia. So all the moisture in the Pacific Ocean gets pumped over northern and eastern Australia, which enhances rainfall. It also lowers the pressure through the northern part of Australia. That also increases rainfall. And just because the the waters are warmer than normal, you also see increased evaporation, so there's more moisture in the air, and that also leads to an increase in rainfall. Here in the studio, we're sort of trained that anything over 30 millimetres in an hour is going to set off an alarm bell. Um, out on the road, if you were driving along, we've all been in that situation where the rain is so heavy you have to pull over for 10 minutes, but that's 10 minutes. When it's 60 millimetres in an hour, that's an hour that you have to stay pulled over on the side of the road because you just can't see through your windscreen. In the Rockhampton district, more than 280 millimetres fell in four days. Further west, nearly 120 millimetres fell on Emerald in one day. Flooding is very much an event that's produced not just by the rain at the time, but the lead up to the whole event. And the worst floods are always after the catchments are totally saturated. And when they're saturated, any water that falls after that, it, it only runs off, nothing, nothing goes into the ground. So we were in that situation after Tasha, and uh, we knew that we were going to be in trouble with uh, southeastern Queensland because everything was totally saturated. The wet season had only just begun. Rainfall was already well above average. Catchments were overflowing, the ground soaked. The stage for catastrophe was set. For well, the period from late November to early January, we saw massive rain through the eastern part of Australia. There were six major rain events, so the catchments were completely saturated through southeast Queensland. Then what we saw was a very moist onshore airstream flowing into an upper low pressure system that was sitting above the atmosphere. And that was the almost the perfect storm for more heavy rain that was going to fall. So in the second week of January, we saw widespread falls of more than 200 millimetres over southeast Queensland. On the 8th of January 2011, heavy rain began to fall in Brisbane and its surroundings, including the rural region west of the city, Toowoomba and the Lockyer Valley. In just three days, more than 230 millimetres fell on Toowoomba alone. Then when locals thought it couldn't get any heavier, on the 10th, the heavens opened. 100 millimetres of rain in one hour, what, does that, what would that feel like? Now, if you can think of the heaviest thunderstorm you've ever seen in your life, and you were standing outside in that for one hour, the thunderstorm didn't move for one hour, that's what 100 millimetres of rain feels like in one hour, guaranteed to produce flash flooding. David Judson witnessed the beginnings of a disaster from his office window. Monday the 10th of January, it was the first day back. There was just torrential rain. 
as I watched it, it came to a level that I'd just never seen before. And that's when I got my camera out and started to film. Oh, that's unbelievable. There's another one. Gone. You don't start out thinking that you're going to be documenting history. Um, but that day I did. Whoa! The volume of water that came and the strength and power that it had, it just literally picked up the cars and dragged them away. Oh, that is horrible. I'm incredibly thankful that what we saw was just a car park. These were empty cars. In other areas of Toowoomba, there were people in those cars. For situations like Toowoomba, um, you're looking at just a little spot of black on a radar that's not moving. That's the other thing, you know, radar rain moves, it moves on, it travels. But in the case of Toowoomba, it just sat there for like an hour, two hours. The official figures given out by the Bureau were 60 millimetres in an hour, uh, but we believe, uh, just looking at the amount of rain and, and the wall of water that came through Toowoomba, and also some informal conversations we had uh, from people over the phone, from viewers, uh, we think there was probably rainfall of up to 100 millimetres an hour between the official rain gauges. I was preparing material to go and brief the public that we were expecting flooding uh, in these cities and people had to start preparing for it. And the Deputy Commissioner of Police was coming to the press conference with me and literally almost as we were walking into the press conference he said, Premier, I just have to brief you. Uh, we have a very serious situation emerging in Toowoomba. We have very little detail because uh, everybody who can is out on the front line. He said, Premier, we are doing swift water rescues in the main street of Toowoomba. And a cold chill just went through me. This is a, a, a very pretty regional city on the top of a mountain. So the idea that, just that sentence, we're doing swift water rescues in the main street of Toowoomba, told everybody immediately that something extreme and bizarre was happening. An incredible example of, of the power of water how much force it, it, can, it can have, like how it can just take cars and, and throw them down the river. It, it's, it's pretty humbling just to show, you know, there's so much stuff that controls us. In the floods of Rockhampton and Theodore just a fortnight earlier, rising river levels could be monitored and warnings delivered well in advance. In Toowoomba's case, torrential monsoonal-like rain falling on an already saturated catchment, they have no time for evacuations. When you get a, a wall of water moving down very quickly down through a, um, through a, a valley, it carries all before it. Um, it, it will uh, completely destroy houses, uh, take cars off roads, uh, basically carrying all before it, rip trees out. Uh, it's one of the most powerful forces in nature. Toowoomba sits high on the Great Dividing Range west of Brisbane. If the rain flooded the town at 600 metres, what was it going to do to the valleys below? In part two of Forecast for Disaster, La Nina strikes. Australia's extraordinary weather continues. The lessons to be learned from the double-edged sword. <laughs> Replenishing the agricultural belts of central and eastern Australia but wiping whole towns off the map in the process. This weather may break our hearts, and it is doing that, but it will not break our will. <laughs>